Well, good morning. It's so nice to be with you again this morning. My uh, hope and prayer is that this morning's worship service will be encouraging to you and uh, bring you closer to our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, your elders have had quite a few conversations about what we might do as we go back to in-person church, and there are good plans in place, uh, ready to go once the uh, order to uh, stay home and not uh, gather is lifted. And we'll be, uh, we can make that happen in just one week's time. So uh, we have masks uh, in stock. We have all sorts of cleaning supplies and uh, we have a good plan for seating for both worship services in Hanson Hall. So we'll look forward to doing that uh, once we uh, get the okay from public health officials. So pray for that. Uh, our prayers go out to many others in our congregation, some of whom are sick. Uh, we're sad we don't have a prayer list uh, coming out. We're going to actually reconstitute that. If you have people that you would like to have in our prayer list, uh, please contact the church office, leave a message with Luann Velez, and uh, we'll make sure that that person is in our prayer list that we'll be putting out in the uh, uh, newsletter. And so uh, make a point this week of doing that so we have an updated prayer list to disseminate to folks. Make sure people also want their name on the list. Don't be surprising people uh, with their name without having first checked to make sure they want to be on the list. Also, just wanted to draw your attention. We have a, normally we have a little deacon's card and it kind of looks like this. So, um, of course, a lot smaller than this when we put it in the church bulletin. Um, our deacon's fund normally relies on those gifts uh, through the little green envelope on communion Sundays. Now we have not had those envelopes out and uh, there's no real reasonable way to put those out. But if you're uh, normally a supporter of the deacons on Communion Sundays, I want to encourage you to maybe make a special gift to the deacons as they have been expending money to care for the needs of the church family in the last uh, few months. And we expect with the ongoing unemployment and all that uh, we'll have a need and a call for additional support for families that may be suffering. And so if uh, you feel called by the Lord to um, uh, support the ministry of the deacons. We thank you so much for that. So let's pray as we prepare for worship. Dear God, be with us today. Let your word be an encouragement to us. Uh, help us to realize uh, the high call we have in Jesus and a high call in the church uh, to be building the kingdom for you. And Lord, uh, through this uh, time of COVID sequestering, we ask that you would... Uh, Give us courage, give us clarity around the work ahead. We pray for our pastor nominating committee as they're interviewing a great group of candidates. We ask that you would inspire them and the candidates as uh, they have conversations about who you're calling to be the next pastor here at Church of the Valley. And we trust you, dear Lord, to guide us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Reading this morning from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Wait, Wait for, for the, the Lord. Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord.
Good morning. Today's sermon is taken from Numbers, and it's a, it's a, it's a, one of the most tragic stories in the Bible, and uh, you'll come up on it pretty soon. You know, I have a love-hate relationship with football, and primarily because my favorite football team is the San Francisco 49ers. Um, and, uh, you know, we just live and... Uh, uh, get hurt by how well our teams do. And I really like to win. I don't like my team to lose. And I still remember the years when the 49ers were the Super Bowl champs year after year after year. I kind of got used to them winning. And then when they stopped winning, I wasn't so used to ha having them not winning. And uh, this year it was so exciting to see them in the Super Bowl again, uh, playing against those evil Kansas City Chiefs. And uh, they were ahead in the fourth quarter. And I really thought that the 49ers, after many, many years of no national championships, were going to win it. But they were ahead in the fourth quarter when Kansas City scored with three minutes left on the clock. In the last three minutes, the 49ers' offense collapsed with lousy play calling and with the evil, evil Chiefs winning. And the headlines for the newspaper that next day just had one word, heartbreaker. Heartbreaker. The children of Israel experienced the same heartbreaker when they were uh, leaving Egypt. Remember the great miracles that God performed? Uh, the great miracles, the signs and wonders that got them free from Egypt? And they, uh, the great, greatest miracle of all was the parting of the Red Sea and going out into the wilderness. What had happened is they walked through the dust and grinding routine of the wilderness and traveled for almost two years 
to get to the banks of the River Jordan. It just took them a long time to get there. There were hundreds and thousands of them. So they were it was a slow travel. It took them a long time to get there. And uh, only one word could really be used to describe their deliverance from Egypt. And that's a word kind of unbelievable, just unbelievably great. God had told them that the land was theirs for the taking. The land that they were going to was there. But what happened next was just heartbreaking. It was a heartbreaker. Standing on the banks of tomorrow, they faltered and failed because their faith gave way to their fears. They said, we can't take the land. We saw the sons of Enoch there. They are giants. They are big, tall men. And when we looked at them, we felt like grasshoppers, a bug to be crushed. Uh, what had happened is Moses sent spies out into the land to see what the land was like so that they could plan going into the land. Ten of the twelve spies came back with that same conclusion. Uh, it was too hard to go in there, but two of the spies, Caleb and Joshua, said, let's do it, let's go, we can do this. God has given us this land to possess, God's given it to us. But you know what happened? The majority ruled that day. The children of Israel snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. And standing on the banks of tomorrow, they looked back and their faith gave way to their fears. Instead of the promised land, they, were, they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, an endless circling of the wagons, until a whole generation had passed away. Uh, Shakespeare, uh, the great uh, English writer, has these great lines in the uh, play Julius Caesar. And, and it's this, it's a great line, it's this. There is a tide in the affairs of humans, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune, but omitted all the voyage in their life is bound in shallows and miseries. On such a full sea as we now afloat, we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. The saddest words in the entire Bible, apart from the death of Jesus, are these words, where God says, tomorrow you must turn back into the wilderness in the direction of the Dead Sea. End quote. Turn back when the promise is ahead. To turn toward yesterday when tomorrow is calling. To be filled with fear when faith is the answer. Men and women, that is the definition of a heartbreaker. Now, there are some vital lessons to be learned from this Old Testament passage. And the first lesson is obvious. Beware. Be aware. Pay attention. Be engaged. Take care when you look back, for often when you look back, we just want to go back. And when we remember something back there, it's always better in our mind's eye than in reality. The good old days, remember the good old days? You know what, they're never really as good as they seem in retrospect. It's not all bad to look back, because sometimes you can look back and see things in better perspective. Looking back can help us develop a good sense of how to improve the future. Um, I've got these words from a minister in Nebraska. This is what he says as he looked back over his life. And this is a pastor who had just reached 98 years old. This is what he said. He said, if I had my life to live over again, I'd try to make more mistakes next time. I would relax. I would limber up. I would be sillier than I have been on this trip. I know a very few things I would take seriously. I would take more trips. I would be crazier. I would climb more mountains. I'd swim more rivers and watch more sunsets. I would do more walking and looking around. I would eat more ice cream and less vegetables. I would, I would have more actual troubles and fewer imaginary ones. You see, I'm one of those people who lives life prophylactically and sensibly hour after hour, day after day. Oh, I've had my moments, and if I had to do it over again, I'd have a whole lot more of them. In fact, I'd try to have nothing else, just moments, one after another. Instead of living so many years ahead each day, I've been one of those people who never go anywhere without a thermometer, 
a hot water bottle, a gargle, a rain coke, aspirin, and a parachute. If I had to do it over again, I would go places, do things, travel lighter than I have. If I had my life to live over, I would start barefooted earlier in the spring and stay that way later in the fall. I would ride on more merry-go-rounds. I'd pick more daisies. I'd play with my grandchildren a whole lot more. But beware of looking back. Looking back can immobilize you. It can fill you with the fear of change rather than take from it the lessons that it offers. And here's another point. The first one was be aware. Be aware of life. Be aware of what looks, life looks like. But the second one is to realize that leaders lead, but it takes courage for leaders to lead. I love the way the Bible captures the feeling of his, the Israelite leaders. The majority report comes suggesting not going forward. As Number says, these uh, 10 spies say, we felt like grasshoppers before them. They were so tall. Isn't that great? They saw the dangers. They felt like bugs to be crushed. But what, by what they saw, they lost their courage. They lost their faith. They lost their hope in God. They lost their confidence that God would be with them. And they weren't willing to take risks anymore. As we look at the verses, we see a couple of things. First of all, notice that the majority rules. That's how we are as Presbyterians, the majority rules. The majority ruled here, but they got it wrong. It's very important for groups of people as they make decisions to listen to the one or two people who have a different view, especially if that view is a strong, positive, encouraging view. Men and women, leaders who are afraid cannot lead. Now the Church of the Valley has a session, and I have to tell you, you have a wonderful session, a group of elders and leaders. You've got some wonderful deacons who do pastoral care and love the church family. And we have always operated with a strong consensus about the decisions we've made. But men and women, there is no automatic future for the church or even for the nation if we just go with the majority rules. The future of both depends on the leaders and people paying attention to where God is leading and go there, even if it means getting your feet wet in the Jordan River and going up against what seems like giants. Elton Trueblood says, the person who never goes out on a limb will never, it is true, have the limb cut off behind them, but neither will they reach the best fruit. I kind of like that. And Winston Churchill rallied a nation with a sentence when he was inaugurated in uh, the beginning of World War II. He said, I have nothing to offer the country but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. And that's what it takes to win against Nazism and fascism and totalitarianism. It takes everything we can to beat those giants. Men and women, it takes courage to reach out for tomorrow. And even as the church, it takes courage for Church of the Valley to reach out tomorrow. And you've got courage. Look at you. Look at these uh, buildings that you're supporting. Uh, look at the uh, 1030 service with new screens and things going on. Look at our great nine o'clock service with great traditional worship, the biggest choir in the, in the entire valley, a great ministry going on. You folks have faith. And you guys folks have courage. And the challenge we have is to reach out into this community with that faith and courage and invite people in and let them know that there is a God who loves them and Jesus is here for them. Do you realize, men and women, that we literally hold the future of the church in our hands and in our voices just by how we portray ourselves in the community? All that it can be and all that it will be, everyone that we can serve and will serve, every single person that will be saved by the gospel proclaimed from this pulpit and from the mouths of the people in the pews, we hold all of that in our hands today. It might be possible in 35 years for this church to be a, a tremendous influence for good in the community, to once again not only regain the heights of its history, but even surpass them. Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people will be moving to the high desert in the years ahead. Will we as a church reach out to them? Will we have the vital and vibrant ministries to do it? 
Your leaders are ready to do that. Your pastor nominating committee is looking for a pastor who will lead us into that future. And you can rest assured that the Lord will provide adequate leadership for this wonderful church. And the Holy Spirit power, we know the power that raised Jesus from the dead, can rekindle a spark and flame of a church and a church that wants to be alive with the gospel. That's who we are as Church of the Valley. I want to tell you, men and women, that I see my task in terms of leadership, and I'm not leading us back to Egypt, and your session doesn't want me to. We're moving ahead with uh, ministry and a big heart, especially when this uh, COVID battle is uh, over and we can start meeting person to person. We've already planned our vacation Bible school for the summer. You know what? Things will be different. I can, uh, I can guarantee that things will be different, but we're also gonna take care of folks. One of the things we're looking at uh, as we gather together for worship, for those who are afraid to come out and be in worship because they're a little more vulnerable and the virus is still out. Um, the deacons have, and uh, Rob Shaw is their uh, moderator. The new moderator of the deacons is uh, Rob Shaw. Um, uh, he has uh, gone out and brought an FM transmitter and what we can do is on Sundays, we can drive in church for those who are vulnerable. And if you want, you can drive in, be close to church, wave to your friends, say hi, but still have distance by being in a car. And we'll do that until they get a vaccine. We'll have that available for people, kind of drive in church. Um, I'm no Robert Schuler, never plan on being one, but um, look at what we've done with these home worship services. Uh, we have the ability to minister to one another. And so let's uh, keep that alive. Just continuing on. The church and Jesus Christ are not only important for saving people, they are important for the nation and for the country, and even more so now for our country. This is a promised land and a land of promise, and the church is a place of promise. If you wanna make a difference in this world, let me tell you men and women, the first political choice is to believe in Jesus Christ if you want this country to do well. Over a hundred years ago, Alexis de Tocqueville came to this country to study what made America great. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, his uh, book is there, easy to read. I've read it a couple of times. It's such an inspiring uh, book. He wrote it in the 1800s. And just looking at the American experiment, of democracy. And if you haven't read it, uh, as an adult, I really encourage you to read it. It's a marvelous book. At that time, we were still emerging, when he wrote it, we were still emerging um, as a nation in the world scene. And de Tocqueville traveled the land from north to south, east to west, and he experienced many facets of our society. He went to businesses and industry and finance. And then one Sunday, on a, it was an off day for him, and he wasn't a churchgoer, but what happened is he said he discovered the secret of what makes America great. He found it within the sacred places of the American churches. People from everywhere gathering together and worshiping one God. All nationalities, all economic classes, all races, all bowing humbly before God. And this is what he writes. He said, I found the secret. No other nation has it. These people, the Americans, received their power to create this democracy from the one who made them and made it all, from something somewhere out beyond themselves. He found the secret of who and what we were and all that we're becoming in spiritual formation. But men and women with a breakdown of the American family with the erosion of foundational values that undergird a well-lived life, and all of the erosion of ethics today, one wonders if we have lost that spiritual foundation. There are many writing today who have come to the same conclusion as de Tocqueville. It is in our spiritual formation and in our spiritual foundations that we find who we are as a nation and gain the strength to become what we can be as a nation. You know, across the nation, men and women, people are going back to churches in growing numbers. 
Many are believing that it is in the church that they will find their future. And I thank God that we are one of those churches being gathered by God to make a difference in our day. Last year, we baptized well over 30 adults. Um, that's 30 followers of Jesus, 30 new families. Uh, we had a whole group of children and youth baptized that day too. You know, baptisms are a real sign of growth of a church. And I thank God we've, we're gathering another group as soon as we uh, get away from this uh, uh, hiding out in our homes and we gather for worship again, we're gonna get our uh, tub out and we're gonna have more baptisms. We've got people waiting in the wings to be baptized. It's gonna be a great and glorious day. Pulsar George Gallup Jr. says that there are at least seven needs of the American, uh, the average American. This is what uh, Gallup says. The need for shelter and food. Number two, the need to believe life is meaningful and has a purpose. Number three, the need for a sense of community and deeper relationships. Number four, the need to be appreciated and respected. Number five, the need to be listened to and heard. Number six, the need to feel one is growing in faith. And number seven, the need for a practical help in developing a mature faith. Men and women, six of these seven things can be met in a church. And so I just leave you with this thought on this day uh, in the middle of the COVID virus in a time when we're preparing to gather again for worship uh, with this thought. And that is uh, the church's future is ahead and our best days are ahead. And uh, with a new pastor and uh, new energy, uh, it's going to be a wonderful time in Church of the Valley. And so part of that wonderful time is going to be because you, as the members and the friends and the faithful attenders of Church of the Valley, decide, you know what? I'm not afraid. Not afraid to cross over this river into life with a new pastor and a new life and a new community as it forms around growing population. I'm not afraid. I've got courage because Jesus Christ is walking with me and I've got work to do. I can be a steward of my life and I can tell others of the goodness of God in my life. We all have a witness. We all have a story, men and women. And so my prayer is that uh, you would find courage as we gather together again and worship together and also go out and reach people with the faith. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray for my dear friends and for myself as we seek to lead and do your word and your work. Uh, for those who are discouraged today and fearful, give them your grace and your heart and your comfort. Uh, for those who need to be wise and take care of themselves, the, the vulnerable or high risk, uh, give them the assurance that that's a good thing to do and be smart about their lives. And Lord, we pray that you'd guide us all in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and lift up your head and kindly smile to you and let you know that the peace of Christ is there for you. The peace of God be with you. Amen. God bless. See you next week.